Hello, this is Kenny Lee Burgess and welcome to the Mojo Bag, episode one. First, I'd like to thank all the people who joined my group here on The Nation, How to Play Cigar Box Guitar. So what I plan to do is a series of talks of practical and abstract information that hopefully players and builders alike will find interesting and maybe applicable to how they're going to design their instruments and how they want to figure out to play their instruments. Because it's like Shane says all the time, there are no rules. So um, I figured that this information being kind of vague and abstract might be really useful as opposed to kind of being very specific. So uh, I hope you enjoy this and please feel free to write me and uh, uh, ask any questions or if you have any ideas for future talks, please throw them at me. There is a Brazilian martial art called capoeira that traces its roots back to African slaves. The practitioners of this art perform unchoreographed fighting dances while being accompanied by traditional instruments. One of these instruments is called the bitten bow and is clearly an example of an early forerunner of the diddly bow. It even looks exactly like a bow that is used to shoot an arrow. The bitten bow consists of a steel string that is held under tension by a wooden bow. A gourd is attached to the bow acting like a resonating chamber to amplify the sound and create the tone. It is also played percussively by striking the string with a wooden stick and changing the pitch by touching the string with a small stone or coin. The striking hand also holds a small shaker to add more rhythmic sound. What I think is interesting to note is the bitten bow contains the three essential elements that are also used in building a cigar box guitar. A stick, a string, and a box. The stick provides tension for the string and is the scale length that will determine the pitch. Longer scale, lower pitch. Shorter scale, higher pitch. The string, whose strength is determined by its diameter, can be matched with the scale length to create the proper tension. So, the box or resonating chamber can vibrate correctly and amplify and create the tone. Remember, too much tension or not enough tension can cause the instrument to function improperly. If something ain't vibrating, you're not producing sound waves. You know why we're on the subject of strings? You know, you don't have to use steel. You know, you could use nylon. Or, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's manufacturers that still make strings out of gut. So if you really wanted to go with that traditional thing, you get yourself some gut strings. But there's just a couple things you keep in mind about nylon or gut is that they're lower tension strings. So if you build an instrument, you're going to want to build it even lighter because if you build it too strong and stable, those lower tension strings won't vibrate the box. And then on the other side of that, that's the reason why on a classical guitar you never put steel strings because it can't take the tension of the steel strings. It'll just fold up and break up. You know, here's another little piece of information. Now, I never got around to trying this, but I, I really should because I... I heard this from Stefan Grossman. He said that the old blues players a lot of times would not use the wound G string on their guitars. They'd actually look for the heaviest plain steel string that they could find and put that on. And then they would be able to tune it up to G. And, and I would have to think it would give you an interesting sound. It would be like you had another lead string. So, you know, if anybody gives that a shot, tell me how that works out. Now, when you play a note on your guitar, you might think that's all that's happened is the string is moving up and down, kind of like a jump rope, but that's really not quite right. You have to remember back in the day to your science class and the sine wave, kind of like an S laying on its side, because what's really happening is there's waves on the string. So it's like one side of the string is going up as the other side's going down, so it's kind of oscillating like this. Okay, up and down like that. And this is why when you go to the 12th fret and you play that harmonic, it rings because you're cutting the string in half. It's it's kind of at one. It's at a center of one of those kind of oscillations. Now to take this a step back, you secure the string to a guitar in two places, at the tuners and at the pins. If you have a pin bridge or if you have a tailpiece at the tailpiece. Now the strings are secure, but then the next thing is you cut the string, and that gets cut at the bridge and at the nut so it vibrates better, but also that defines the scale length. Okay, so scale length is always from the bridge to the nut. So here's something interesting. 
if I play this note here at the uh, open, actually, if I would move up 12 steps up to the 12th fret and play that note, it's going to be the same note, but double the frequency. And then if it was possible to go up another 12 steps, it would, the frequency would double again. So in Western music, how this works out is from the open note, you're moving up 12 steps until it repeats again. And one of the interesting things to note about that, that it's 12 steps, which is called the chromatic scale, is if you listen to it, it almost sounds like staircase, like you're going up a stair, but it's equal steps. You know, it seems all perfectly measured. But as you notice, and you look at the fingerboard, actually the frets are getting closer together. That's what's causing it to sound the pitch go up, but it still sounds evenly tempered. So that's why it's important the frets are in the right places because they're actually doing the job of creating the correct pitches. So that little instrumental break there was just to kind of illustrate a little bit of a point in the sense that when you utilize open tunings, the nice thing about this is, is that the scales, the chromatic scale for the key I'm playing in, like for right now I'm in, I'm in Vastable tuning tuned down to the key of C, my scales basically fit right in the 12 frets, right there's the chromatic scale. So really by utilizing different scales, the major scale or the pentatonic blue scale or the Indian scale or a variety of scales, you're able to play complete songs in a very easy way. Now in closing this talk, I want to talk a little bit about Robert Johnson because everybody knows the story about that he went down to the crossroads about midnight and he met a strange man which was the devil and he sold his soul and became the greatest guitarist. But there's that part of the story where he hands him his guitar and the devil retunes it and then plays a song and then hands it back to him. So that's kind of interesting because it, it kind of tells the story of the kind of mystery and magic of open tunings, you know? And uh, there's just one little thing I'd like to say. Now, this is not an endorsement. There's a guy by the name of Gene Roebuck and he wrote a book called Finding Robert Johnson. Now, you can find him on YouTube and listen to his videos, but he never shows uh, what he's playing directly into the camera. But it, it sounds very good. You know, and his thesis is basically that Robert Johnson would just uh, tune a couple strings and he could be able to play his whole repertoire, you know. And even, he didn't need a capo, that kind of idea. That, But anyway, so in the book, it's kind of disappointing because he, uh, he doesn't even cite the examples in standard music or tablature. He has his kind of own way of writing music so he never really proves his thesis but uh, it just really fuels more fire to the controversy was there some kind of secret tuning but most people today think open G and open D and open A and open E with a capo is the way he went but everybody loves a good mystery